Lesson 32 and Lesson 33, Women, the Constitution, and Policy, AP Government. So the struggle for women's equality, it has emphasized legislation over litigation. In other words, this hasn't been something that has been handled through the court system. This has been handled through legislation, through acts of Congress, through passing laws. So the battle for the vote. The first women's rights activists were products of the abolition movement. So um, early on in the North, you have this real big push to end slavery. And um, some of the uh, anti-slavery activists, the abolition activists, were also interested in feminism. Uh, one of the things that they had to deal with uh, early on was the legal doctrine of coverture which deprived married women of any identity separate from that of their husbands. So it became a situation where you, you got married to a man and suddenly everything you owned was his. And if you were to divorce, it went with him uh, more often than not. So women had very few rights, married women especially, had very few rights under this system. And it, you know, it was insanely easy for a man to abuse his wife. It was uh, pretty easy in, in lots of places for a man, for example, who was mad at his wife to just basically claim she was crazy and have her committed for a while. Um, I remember reading about uh, some accounts, some dramatizations of accounts uh, of uh, that happening that were based off of real life events. So some of the big figures in uh, the uh, feminist uh, women's rights movement early on in uh, the U.S. Lucretia Mott, uh, pictured here, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton organized a meeting at Seneca Falls, uh, Seneca Fall News, Falls New York uh, to discuss women's rights. This Seneca Falls meeting happened in 19, uh, sorry, 1848. And uh, so here we go, the Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions, signed on July 19, 1848. It was the beginning of the movement that would culminate in the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. So here you, you go, you have the Seneca Falls Declaration. It's going to take a very long time for their goal to be met. So 52, 72 years total. And uh, this, this is a big deal. And you can see the connection with abolition. One of the speakers was Frederick Douglass, uh, a leading advocate, of course, for freeing African-American slaves in the South. So then you in enter into a period after the uh, success with the 19th Amendment of the so-called doldrums, 1920 to 1960. The feminist movement seemed to have lost its momentum, uh, possibly because the, the vote was about the only goal that feminists agreed on. There's a great deal of conflict about how much further to go so there wasn't enough uh, unity to get anything done. Alice Paul, the author of the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, seen here, pictured here, claimed the real result of protectionist law was to perpetuate sexual inequality. Most people in the 1920s saw the ERA as a threat to the family, though. So the idea of the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, was to basically become a gender-blind society that didn't take into account much of uh, the differences between men and women. And um, Alice Paul's argument is that these laws, some of these laws that were designed supposedly to help women, uh, actually just created uh, more of a sense of the difference between men and women, and in, sometimes, in some cases backfired. So laws designed to protect women from being overworked uh, meant that they were less attractive workers than men because, well, it was easier uh, to get a guy to uh, work extra hours without getting in trouble because you've broken some sort of law or something. So the second feminist wave, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s attracted many women activists and groups like the National Organization for Women and the National Women's Political Caucus were organized in the 1960s and 1970s. Today, of course, now, the National Organization of Women is, is probably the most uh, well-known feminist organization in the United States. The National Women's Political Caucus, though, uh, had some very important membership. It had, uh, of course, Betty Friedan, who had written 
the book The Feminine Mystique, which is this kind of commentary on what uh, a modern feminist uh, should uh, argue for. And she argued that women should go, get out there and take charge of their lives and, and uh, uh, have identities through their work, just like men do. And uh, is very, very uh, explosive uh, book, very influential. Um, it's one of the things that can be tested on in AP European history and in AP world history. It's one of those things that crosses through a lot of the courses you're going to take. And here's a picture of Betty Friedan. Uh, Gloria Steinem was also a mem member of the National Women's Political Caucus. She's still around uh, being interviewed and, and things like that. So judicial development. Sorry there's so much text on this page. Some things just don't break down uh, very easily. Before the advent or the beginning of the contemporary feminist movement, the Supreme Court held, uh, had upheld up virtually all cases of sex-based discrimination. In 1971, the Reed versus Reed case, the court ruled that any arbitrary sex-based classification violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, because this is, of course, after the feminist movement has been pushed uh, and has been moving forward. So this marks the first time, the Reed versus Reed case, marks the first time the court applied the 14th Amendment to a case involving classification by sex. So Reed versus Reed, very important. It's, it's using the 14th Amendment, incorporating protections to women, to people based on their gender. In Craig v. Boren, 1976, the court established a medium scrutiny standard. We've already discussed the medium scrutiny standard under which sex discrimination would be presumed to be neither valid nor invalid. And the Supreme Court now has struck down uh, many laws and rules for discriminating on the basis of gender. Some of the litigants have actually been men seeking equality with women in the treatment under the law in areas, say, like alimony, in inheritance rights, things like that. So the Equal Rights Amendment was revived when Congress uh, passed it in 1972 and granted a three-year extension six years later. Uh, the ERA fell three states short of ratification, but losing the ERA battle, ERA battle the Equal Rights Amendment battle, has also stimulated vigorous feminist activity in the country. So now we get to women in the workplace. As conditions have changed, public opinion and public policy demands have also changed. The traditional family role of father at work and mother at home is becoming a thing of the past. And those of you who took AP World History with me, or AP European History for that matter, know that that traditional family role is really something born out of the Industrial Revolution. So this kind of blip on the radar where uh, it was expected for women to be at home and men to, to go to work outside the home, when before it was basically men and women stayed home and worked at home. And now we're in a situation where not only men are moving out and working uh, away from home, but now women are as well. Uh, this is just kind of a natural progression of uh, technological changes and social changes as a result of the industrial and post-industrial revolution. The civilian labor force now includes 64 million women. Uh, and to give you an idea what this means, there's 74 million males. Now, this is old data. This is data from several years ago. So the numbers probably are different, but they probably aren't too different for that to be instructive in understanding how many women are working and how many men are working. There are 30 million female-headed households, uh, or there were at the time of the textbook uh, was, was published. And about two-thirds of American mothers who have children below school age are in the labor force. So you've got, you know, two-thirds of, of moms uh, with uh, infants, toddlers, uh, and, uh, you know, three-year-olds, four-year-olds who, who are still working. And so, they're, you know, of course that means that we've had to come up with some sort of way to compensate in child rearing uh, with this, this change. So there are lots of daycares and, and uh, even daycares at, at certain job sites. And here you can see on the side the pictures, kind of the shifting uh, views of, of women at work. Women working in the home in good housekeeping, August 1928. And then Rosie the Riveter. And the, the huge transformations in how we viewed women as a result of things like World War I and World War II. Really World War II. 
So congressional legislation, remember that, that the courts have not been that active in this area. This has been driven more by Congress than we saw uh, for African Americans. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 banned uh, sex discrimination in employment. In 1972, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was given the power to sue employers uh, suspected of illegal discrimination. In uh, the Title IX of the Education Act of 1972, it forbade sex discrimination in federally subsidized education programs, including athletics. And this has been kind of controversial because in the case of athletics, uh, sometimes it's hard to field uh, a team uh, for women in certain sports, so you have to compensate by uh, offering other sports programs. And uh, culturally, we're just not there yet. And uh, so there have been uh, some people claim that, that there have been uh, various sports in, at, at colleges, for example, that have shut down because they couldn't field enough women's sports uh, to compensate. The other, the other argument is that uh, sports for, for women tend not to be profitable. So it's kind of controversial. Sometimes society hasn't caught up to the law uh, on a particular issue, and so that kind of can create some sort of a, kind of a inconvenience or economic dislocation. Three of the most controversial issues that legislators will continue to face, though, are wage discrimination, the role of women in the military, and sexual harassment. These are very difficult to deal with. In the case of wage discrimination, you have uh, issues. It's, it's, it's uh, tricky because, for example, certain job fields are traditionally uh, areas where women tend to work more than men and vice versa. And so in those situations, how, how do you have fair wages? Um, because you know secretaries don't get paid as well as some people who have a different title, who do something else, but usually their skill set's the same. So that's, that makes it very complicated for the courts to be involved in. Role of women in the military, that's a tough one too. Uh, there are physical differences between men and women that affect uh, military applications, employment. So that gets tricky. Plus there's social issues. Uh, many people are just not fond of the idea of a mom getting out there with a gun and getting fired at. And the sexual harassment is really tough because we want to be able to protect people from sexual harassment, but we also want to be able to protect people uh, from uh, abusive uh, prosecution. So that's a very complicated one because often sexual, oftentimes sexual harassment leaves absolutely no physical evidence. The Supreme Court has frequently ruled against gender discrimination in employment and business activity. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, oftentimes people have more protections than they realize against those kinds of things. And they, they tend not to realize with uh, just a little bit of documentation and maybe a trip to a lawyer, they can get a lot of this kind of stuff taken care of. So lesson 33, wage discrimination and comparable worth. The U.S. Supreme Court has remained silent so far on the issue of comparable worth, which is kind of what I was getting at a couple of slides back. This refers to the fact that traditional women's jobs often pay much less than men's jobs that demand comparable skill. So the Supreme Court hasn't really gotten into that. And median annual earnings for full-time women workers are only about two-thirds those of men. So obviously there's something still going on. It's kind of complicated. Um, and uh, we do know there are differences in how men and women handle their jobs. Um, and. Uh, of course, we're not in sociology class, so I won't get into that too much. So women in the military. Women have served in every branch of the armed services since World War II, originally in separate units, but now as part of the regular service. Uh, women comprise 11% of the armed forces and compete directly with men for promotion. And here we see four uh, F-15 pilots. Uh, apparently, they've done their their deal and they're kind of happy. Who knows what they're talking about, but they, they look like they're ready to go, uh, you know, get those uh, heavy boots off and, and have, have a decent time celebrating a job well done. Um, that's one of the areas where women have excelled in the military. If apparently, physiologically, I've, I've read that, that women handle G-forces better than men, which would be very useful for combat pilot uh, work. 
There are still two important differences between the treatment of men and women in military service. Only men have to register for the draft when they turn 18, so they have to sign up you know, through selective service. This was upheld in Rosker versus Goldberg in 1981. And there are also some statutes and regulations that prohibit women from serving in combat. Now, as anybody who followed the uh, war in Iraq early on will, uh, will know, um, that doesn't mean that combat won't find the women uh, who are in the military who have what are technically considered non-combat jobs. So, you know, if you're uh, a woman in the military and your job is to drive a truck that's technically not supposed to be a combatant, and you're driving down the road and the bad guys come over and shoot at you, well, you're in a firefight and they don't really care whether you're a woman or not. And there were uh, plenty of instances of things like that happening. And um, in, in the news, we followed that. Women handled themselves quite well in those situations. So sexual harassment can occur anywhere, but it may be especially prevalent in male-dominated occupations such as the military. Uh, sexual harassment violates federal policies against sexual discrimination in the workplace. Um, although it was not a violation of federal policy when Anita Hill worked for Clarence Thomas, which is something the book brought up. I'm not so sure I would have kind of built that together like that. Anita Hill was a uh, law uh, professor at uh, the OU Law School, and uh, she had told a friend of hers that she had been sexually harassed by Clarence Thomas years before, and so when he was nominated to become a member of the Supreme Court, to become a justice in the Supreme Court, um, her friend called someone, got her, I believe, on tape, and leaked out that she had accused him of uh, sexual harassment, and then Anita Hill was kind of forced to make the deal public, and uh, she was heard before hearing uh, in the Senate to confirm Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas was eventually confirmed because she couldn't prove the claims, and uh, so I don't know if your textbook should have brought that up the way it did in the book or not since she couldn't prove it. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's an issue there. Um, sexual harassment in the military, a, a great example is the tail hook incident. You can look that up about uh, some, some naval officers at, at uh, uh, a hotel where they have kind of a big naval convention. And apparently uh, women uh, in the Navy uh, were randomly groped in, in uh, hotel hallways. In Harris versus Forklift Systems, 1993, the Supreme Court held that no single factor is required to win a sexual harassment case under Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So the law is uh, violated when the workplace environment would reasonably be perceived and is perceived as hostile or abusive. So there's no one thing you have to hang a sexual harassment lawsuit on. Whatever it is, it has to be basically something that's kind of inappropriate uh, and um, is seen as uh, something designed to intimidate or exploit uh, someone sexually or single them out because of their sex. In 1996 and 1997, a number of Army officers and non-commissioned officers had the careers ended and some went to prison for sexual harassment of female soldiers in training situations. So, you know, this is basic training and, and uh, yeah, so some really bad stuff was going on. I remember reading about that. In Farragher versus the City of Boca Raton, 1998, the Supreme Court stated that employers can be held liable or even those harassing acts of supervisory employees that violate clear policies and in which top management has no knowledge. So the, the company itself doesn't even need to know that they've got some manager who is harassing uh, someone uh, for them to be held liable for it. So you better be very careful uh, who you hire if you own a business. 